I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to see some of your faces again. Um, I was here less than three months ago. How many of you remember my face? Oh, nice. <laughs> and so in, I mean, I've not been preaching for a long time. Um, I've been preaching for about, I mean, consistently for about eight years. Um, in the past four years, I've preached over 700 messages in the past four years. Um, but I say that to say, but when it comes to preaching in churches, uh, this is the first church that I will ever have to preach twice in less than three months. <laughs> So you get the math, right? So I really want to appreciate you. Thank you. Yes, please. <laughs> I really want to say a big thank you for having me again. And that means I possibly did a good job the last time. And you gave Pastor a good feedback. And then he said he should call me again. There are lots of amazing preachers in Winnipeg. So it's such a great privilege to be here a second time. Thank you so much. Um, as always, I'm just going to pray. And we're going to have a great time. Are you ready? All right, Father, we just want to thank you. We thank you because we know we're going to see Jesus again in the beauty of his holiness. And let your name alone be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name, I have prayed. And let God's people say, Amen. Let's fly to the book of John, chapter 3. The last time I was here, uh, we checked John, chapter 3, the story of Nicodemus. We'll just pick it up from there. I mean, since it's just less than three months ago, right? So let's just pick it up from there. John chapter 3. If you have your Bible, say hi. Okay, so John chapter 3. I have my version here. I'm using New Living Translation. So we're going to start from verse 1. John and chapter 3. John and chapter 3. Are we good to go? Perfect. I ask a lot of questions to so just get used to me. Somewhere in your mind, just call me that pastor that has a lot of questions. So bear with me. So John chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says, There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark, one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us, your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. So who is the man we're talking about here, Nicodemus? And who was he speaking with? Jesus. What was he telling Jesus about Jesus? Oh, hey, Jesus, we know you are sent from God. We know you're a miraculous worker. And the last time I was here, we established this point that for you to be in church today, somewhere in your mind, you believe Jesus can do miracles. Do you all agree with that? Yeah, that's why you're here. <laughs> and I even told you that even unbelievers at times, when they go through tough situations, they come to church. Uh, have you had any friend who doesn't, in quote, believe in God or Jesus, but they, are, they were going through a particular situation, then they had to find their way to the church? Uh, uh, do you have anyone like that? Have you seen anyone like that? Yeah, yeah there are people like that. So I'm saying that to say, so this is who Nicodemus is. The knowledge Nicodemus have about Jesus, at least, he knows that Jesus can perform miracles. So he said, he said to Jesus, Jesus, we know no one can do these signs except the Lord is with the person. So the last time we established, well, now that we know what Nicodemus know, let us see what Nicodemus does not know. So we jump to John chapter 3. And verse 3, the Bible says, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 4, what do you mean? Exclaimed Nicodemus, how can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? So clearly we see that Nicodemus does not know what it means to be born again. However, what does he know? He knows that Jesus can do miracles. That simply means when we say we preach the gospel, we are not just telling people, come to Jesus, he will do miracles, he will give you a better life, better marriage, better job. 
That's not the totality of what the gospel is all about. Because if all about Jesus that we tell the world is just better job, better marriage, better relationship, then we are bringing more Nicodemuses to church. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So we don't tell people that Jesus will just, well, come to Jesus and then if Nicodemus was sick when he was speaking with Jesus, he would say, Jesus, pray for me. I know you're a miraculous worker and I'll be healed. Do you agree with that? Yeah, he's going to do that. But we are saying the conversation of being born again is way beyond your present physical needs. And so the whole conversation in John chapter 3 will be Jesus trying to help Nicodemus to understand what it really means to be born again. So we're going to kickstart from that point and we'll talk about what I want to talk about today. But let's pick it up from where we stop. Let's go to verse 5. John chapter 3 verse 5. The Bible says, Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. So now, stay with me. To be born again means you are born of water and the Spirit. Do we all agree with that? Okay. Now, John wrote the book of John from the name. <laughs> you know who wrote the book. So, but that word water and spirit, the word and in the Greek is an interesting word. It is K A I. That was the word that was translated to mean the I. Um, and. So, that word can mean two things. So, the word K A I in the Greek that was translated to English, that is referred to as and, could mean two things. You can check your concordance to confirm. Number one, it could mean a conjunction. A conjunction would join two different things or two different words. So you can say A and B. That's conjunction. Kai, that word in the Greek, it means that. However, that same word, K-A-I, also means something. It means when you are further referring to something, so let's say something like Pastor Paul and the K-A-I, the pastor of Victory Church. So you are not talking about two different people. You are only using that word to further explain what you're talking about. So that word and in this John chapter 3 means Kai. So when it says, except a man is born of water, Kai and spirit, he's not talking about two different things. He's talking about one thing. So he's saying water. I mean, I refer to spirit. Why are we talking about this? So that we don't think water salvation is different from spirit salvation. No. He's only just saying, except the man is born of water, I mean spirit. Now, stay with me. Don't take my word for it. John wrote this. Let's go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Let's, let's check water for a little while. I don't want you to be thirsty, but let's just <laughs> let's check water. John chapter 4. Just one chapter after John chapter 3. Let's just fly to verse... 10. The Bible says, Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift of God, okay, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I will give you living water. So in chapter 3, water. In chapter 4, living water. Stay with me. John chapter 7. So just flip your Bible again. So Jesus said he's giving people living water. We're just trying to understand that that water simply means spirit. But let me show you from John. John chapter 7 says it much more beautifully. John chapter 7 verse 37 downward. The Bible says, On the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowd, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Verse 38 now. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water. You see that word again? Living water. Living water will flow from his heart. Verse 39. When he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit. Did you see that in your Bible? So when Jesus means water, what do you think he's referring to? Spirit. So it could be living water, but it's the same thing. He's talking about the Spirit. I just literally went through that to just show you John chapter 3 is talking about water. I mean spirit. So that means to be born again, we mean you are born of 
the Spirit. Do we all agree with that up to that point? If you're born again here, you must have had the gospel. And what is the gospel? That Jesus died for your sins, he was buried, and God raised him from the dead. Everybody here, do you believe God raised Jesus from the dead? Awesome. And that's why you're here. So we can say you are, number one, born again. Number two, we can say you are born of the Spirit. We all agree with that, right? Okay, then let's go back to John chapter 3. We are going somewhere, don't worry. I just like to take it very slow. John chapter 3. Let's go to verse... So the conversation continued between Nicodemus and Jesus. Then it got to the popular John chapter 3, verse 16. You know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. So stay with me now. So this is the point now. So to be born again means you are born of the Spirit, means you have everlasting life. Do you all agree with that? Okay. The word is everlasting. Some translations call it eternal. But what does it really mean to have eternal life? Well, in a simple word, it means you are going to live forever. That's what we're trying to say. So the believer who is born again has eternal life, is born of the Spirit, and is guaranteed that he is going to live forever. Let me say it another way. The person who is born again, the person who is born of the Spirit, the person who has eternal life is guaranteed that death will not be the end of such a man. Let me say that again. So the one that understands what we're talking about will not be afraid of death because such a person will know that death is not the end of him or her. Why? Because the person is born again, the person has eternal life, the person is born of the Spirit. Is it making sense so far? Let's fly to the book of Acts of Apostles. The book of Acts, chapter 2. Actually, let's start from chapter 1. I'm just trying to say, the gospel you believed is a gospel that says, death has been defeated. That's, that's the meaning of the gospel you believe. You were telling people, God raised Jesus from the dead. What is the implication of the gospel you believe? You will also be raised for adventure you die before Jesus appears again. Let, let me show you Acts. Acts chapter 1. Are you there? I'm going to start reading from verse 8. The Bible says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in jerusalem throughout judea in samaria and to the ends of the earth so this, jesus was sending them to go preach the gospel telling people about jesus what about jesus are we to tell the world well that he died he was buried and god raised him from the dead let us see if the apostles if they obey jesus just flip your bible to act chapter 2 now act chapter 2 we want to see what peter preached Act chapter 2, and let's read verse 32. The Bible says, God raised Jesus from the dead. So what is the gospel we are preaching to people? God raised Jesus from the dead. The Bible says, God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. So Jesus told them in Act chapter 1, go and witness me. In Act chapter 2, Peter was telling them, God will raise Jesus from the dead. Stay with me. Flip your Bible to Acts chapter 3. Don't get tired of flipping your Bible. <laughs> Acts chapter 3, are you there? Okay, thank you. We're going to read verse 15. Peter was speaking here. He said, you killed the author of life. So that's the death of Jesus. But God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this fact. So what is Peter preaching? Resurrection. Whose resurrection? Jesus' resurrection. What is the implication of believing that God raised Jesus? That simply means you are saying, by believing, you are born again. By believing, you have eternal life. By believing, you are born of the Spirit. By believing, God will do to you exactly the same thing he did on the body of Jesus. That is the gospel we preach. We're going to say this. Lots of ways. Don't worry. <laughs> I have another 20 minutes to say the same thing. What I'm trying to say is, the fact that you believe in Jesus' resurrection 
and now you are born again, you have the Spirit of God, God will do exactly the same thing he did on the body of Jesus to your body. So Jesus was on earth, for example, and he would say something like, destroy this temple and I will raise it up on the third day. He was talking about resurrection. And then when they killed Jesus or when he died on the third day, the faithful God raised Jesus from the dead. There's a place in the scriptures that says, all of your promises are yes and amen. Something like that. It should be in 1 Corinthians. That the promises of God in Christ are yes and amen. God made a promise way from the Old Testament through many prophets. And he kept saying, Jesus will be raised. Jesus will be raised. And then when Jesus came, he died and God fulfilled that promise. And if God will fulfill that promise with Jesus, God will fulfill that promise with every single one of us here. Do you understand what we're trying to say now? So his resurrection, you believed. That also means you are also going to be resurrected. That's exactly what we're trying to say. So if you're trying to look for a title to the title my sermon, you can title it Resurrection or Immortality. Is it making sense so far? Do we all understand up to this point? Should we take it a step further? Okay, let's go to the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 68. We are just establishing one point that the gospel we believe in summary is the gospel that death has been defeated. Jesus is the prototype or the first fruit that there will be a resurrection again. But let me show you Psalm 68 and let's go to verse 20. Psalms chapter 68 and verse 20. The Bible says, Our God is a God who saves. The sovereign Lord rescues us from death. What makes God God is a God that saves. What does he save us from? Death. What is man's greatest, biggest enemy? Death. What is every human, rich, poor, whatever you are, what is every man afraid of? Death. So what did God save us from through Jesus? Death. What is salvation? Has anyone ever asked you before, why, why do you want me to be born again? Because at times, people confuse being born again to thinking we are trying to drag them to our church. <laughs> right? I don't know about you, but at times people think like that. When you tell them, oh, do you believe in Jesus? The next thing they will say is, well, I've gone to church like three times, four times. I, I was preaching to a guy one time, and he said exactly this thing. And I'm like, oh, do you believe in Jesus? He said, I've only been to church two times, three times. I said, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about your church attendance status. I'm talking about, do you believe in the one that can save you from death or not? Why do we need to preach the gospel? Why do you need to believe the gospel? Because your faith in the gospel is the only guarantee that you will be saved from man's greatest enemy, death. But we have a God that saves. That's why he's God. That is why you can't make any material thing your God. There are people that, that they build up an image and then they call that image their God. That image cannot save you from death. There's only one person that can save from death. And how are we so sure that he will save us or he saves because he did that on the body of Jesus. And then we know whatever that happens to Jesus, that may God raise him, he will also do exactly the same thing on the body of every one of us here that believes the gospel. So you can't make an image. You cannot make it your God. There was a time in a particular country where people who has um, all these wooden carved image, there was flood. So they were trying to escape from their houses and then some of them now carried those images. And I'm thinking, I thought that was your God. Your God should be the one to save you, not you trying to save your God from the flood. So what makes God the God is, is the only one that can save from death. Your good works cannot save you. Only Jesus can save you. That is the gospel we preach to the rich and to the poor. The rich man needs the gospel. The poor man needs the gospel. Because the gospel of Christ is the only guarantee that death will not be the end of a man that believes in the gospel. What happens if a man doesn't believe the gospel? 
Well, the man goes back to dust. The man just is gone like that. Let me show you Job. Let me put, show you how Job said what I'm trying to say. Job chapter 14. Job chapter 14. Job spoke about this thing I'm talking about. Let me show you how Job said it. So the book of Job is after the book of Genesis. Okay, I was just trying to get your attention. No, not, not Genesis. Um, are you in Job? Okay. Um, Job chapter 14. So Job spoke about this. Let's start from verse 1. How frail is humanity? How short is life? How full of trouble? We blossom like a flower and then wither. Like a passing shadow, we quickly disappear. That's the totality of a man. He's, he's here today, he's gone tomorrow. But Job has asked a question. If you keep reading verse 14, chapter 14, if we drop to verse 14, then he asks one question. He said, can the dead live again? If so, this will give me hope through all my years of struggle. And I would eagerly await the release of death. It's a $1 billion question people have. Can the dead live again? Or what happens after a man passes away? Well, number one, we know what happens based on what we've been saying so far. That the man that believes in Jesus, when he passes away, think about it like a man sleeping on Saturday and waking up to come to church on Sunday. So we say that man has slept in the Lord. Because there's a guarantee of resurrection for such a man that believes in Jesus. That God will do to that man the exact thing he did to the body of Jesus. Do we understand what we're talking about? This is your guarantee that you will also experience resurrection the same way Jesus was raised from the dead. Is it making sense so far? I, I, to me, when I hear something like this, it brings joy to my heart. You're not afraid of death. You're not afraid of what men will do to you. You know you live forever. How are you so sure that you're going to live forever? Well, Romans. Let's go to Romans. Romans chapter 8. All of this thing is littered in the Bible. Romans chapter 8. I will show you verse 11. You will love verse 11. Romans chapter 8. Let me show you what verse 11 says. The Bible says, The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. How many of you believe you have the Spirit of God? How many of you know that the Spirit of God you have is exactly the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. That's exactly what we're trying, talking about. So that's why a man needs to be born again. That means he needs to be born of the Spirit. Because it is that Spirit that will guarantee resurrection. Well, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Let me show you how the Roman says it. The Bible says in verse 11, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead... He will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. The guarantee that God will give life to your mortal body is the fact that you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. Is it making sense to you? Do you understand what we're saying so far? That you believe in the gospel, you receive in the Spirit, you've been born again, born of the Spirit, that same Spirit you received is the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. So, peradventure you pass away before the second appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will also quicken your mortal body. That means God will do exactly what he did on the body of Jesus. He will do it on your body and you'll be raised again. That means death doesn't have the final say on the person who has put their faith in Jesus Christ. When we say something like, the victory of Jesus is our victory, what we mean is the victory of Jesus over death is our victory over death. Is it making sense? In a sense, or in a way, this should kind of help our perspective when we lose a loved one who believed the gospel before they pass away. What does the Bible say about something like that? Let me show you. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. So let's say we, God forbid, but let's say somebody who is so close to you pass away. What does the Bible say about something like that in the light of what we've been talking about? 
First Thessalonians, are you there? First Thessalonians. We're going to read chapter 4, and I'm going to start reading from verse 13. First Thessalonians chapter 4 from verse 13. The Bible says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died. So you will not grieve like people who have no hope. So what is Paul trying to address? He's trying to write to this thought that I want you to be informed. I want you to know what happens to believers when they pass away. What's going to happen? Let's keep reading. Verse 14. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Do you see what we've been talking about since morning? So the guarantee that there will be a resurrection is we've seen God done this on the body of Jesus. And the same way he raised Jesus, every of our loved ones, family and friends, who believe the gospel before the past, will also be raised from the dead. To me, that is good news. That is some awesome news. And that's what the Bible is saying here. Let's keep reading, actually. It gets more interesting. Verse 15. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We, who are still living when the Lord returns, will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Do you see what we're talking about so far? So there's a resurrection that is guaranteed for anyone who passes away before the second appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. What are we saying so far? Death is not the end of the man who put their faith in Jesus. What are we saying so far? For the man who is still alive, who believes in Jesus, that man has no reason to be afraid of death. Is it making sense? Is it making sense? Let's keep reading. Just come to verse 17. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth, will be caught up in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the earth. We will be with the Lord forever. I love verse 18. Verse 18 says, So encourage each other with these words. So my sermon today is an encouragement. Death does not have the final say on the believer. The believer lives forever. Glory to Jesus. That, that's what you have as a believer that the unbeliever doesn't have. Is it making sense? So the fact that you're a believer, what we mean is, number one, you're born again. Number two, you're born of the Spirit. That same Spirit is the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And what God did on the body of Jesus, He will do exactly the same thing on your body. You will be raised. You will be changed. Immortality will swallow immortality. So for as many people out there as well, that is the same good news we preach to them. Do you want to experience life eternal it only comes by believing in jesus it doesn't come by your works or the lack of it it doesn't come by your good works or the lack of it it comes by faith in christ that is the only guarantee that a man will either live forever or not is it making sense everybody let's go to first corinthians this thing is littered everywhere in the scripture we'll go wrap it up on first corinthians first corinthians Chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15 says a lot about my sermon today. It just keep, in a way, Paul just did a good work in explaining what we're talking about. Are we in First Corinthians chapter 15? First Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to start reading from verse 12. The whole argument Paul was trying to address is there were some people in that particular church that they were saying that, well, there won't be a resurrection. So Paul wants to address it. Do you understand the context? So some people in that church were saying, there won't be a resurrection. So Paul wants to address it. So we're going to start reading from verse 12. The Bible says, but tell me this. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? So do you understand the context now? 
Do we understand the context of Proverbs right now? Do you see verse 12? Should, should I read it again? I need to be sure I'm communicating the point. <laughs> so that's why I ask a lot of questions. Are we all in verse 12? Okay. So verse 13 now. For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. So do you get the argument? For you to say, well, I don't believe there will be a resurrection for the believer. What the person is trying to say is, well, I don't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. And the opposite as well. For you to say you believe Jesus was raised from the dead, which is the gospel that makes you a believer, that gets you born again, then you have to also believe that there will be a resurrection of the dead. Let's keep reading. Verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. Verse 15. And we, apostles, will all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. Do you understand what we are reading so far? So the whole argument is, for you to say there won't be a resurrection, what you're trying to say is you don't believe that Christ was raised from the dead. However, if you believe Christ was raised from the dead, then there will be a resurrection of the dead. Is it making sense, everybody? Do we all believe Christ was raised from the dead? So then do you believe that you will be raised as well? That's exactly what we're trying to say. It gets more interesting. Let's keep reading. Let's drop to verse... 19, and if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. Glory to Jesus. Verse 21, so you see, just as death came through the world, came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun, through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given a new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. Is it making sense? Are we getting what we're reading so far? Thank you. Verse 24, after that, the end will come. When he will return, when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. Verse 25, for Christ must reign until he humbles all of his enemies beneath his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So how will this world end? Well, death itself will be destroyed. There will be a death of death. <laughs> That's what the Bible is saying. Because what we call the end, what we call the second appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, is the end of death. There will be no more death. Because we who believe in him will live forever. And Thessalonians will say, encourage one another with these words. Is it making sense? You know, I feel as if teachings like this should just bring a lot of rest and peace to your heart. Knowing that no matter what happens, at times, maybe due to the changing weather, <laughs> you may develop flu or whatever it is. And then, or maybe you're not feeling too well. And there's a tendency for you to start thinking, what if I die? <laughs> there are times people go through that line game. It's a, it's a normal thing. But my point is, with this understanding, it will make you understand that you don't have to be afraid of death. Of course, God will satisfy you with long life. But what we're trying to say is, you are not living your, your life in the fear and anxiety of, what if I die? You are not going to do that anymore. Rather, you're going to start seeing yourself as the one who God has given eternal life. The person who is going to live forever. And you only look forward to the time when you see Jesus again, or when you'll be raised from the dead. That's the time we look forward to. So we're not looking forward to the day of death. No, no. 
But rather, we are looking forward to the resurrection. We are looking forward to the second appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the one who has put his faith in Jesus Christ, death is not the end of such a person. So every fear of death right now by the grace of God begins to melt away. And the love of God begins to dominate your heart. Knowing that at least God has guaranteed you that he will do to your body the exactly the same thing he did on the body of Jesus. Raising Jesus from the dead. So we will all be raised. We will all be changed. I'll show you a couple of few verses and then we'll wrap it up. Let's drop down because of time. Just drop down straight to verse Still in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's drop down to verse 35 because of time. Verse 35. The Bible says, But someone may ask, How will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? Verse 36. What a foolish question. When you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And what you put in the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed of wheat or whatever you are planting. If because of time, drop down to verse 40. 40. The Bible says, There are also bodies in the heavenlies and bodies on the earth. The glory of the heavenly bodies is different from the glory of the earthly bodies. Because of time, drop down to verse 42. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Verse 43, our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried in human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. One last verse. Verse 51. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. How many of you like to hear secrets? Who love secrets? Everybody does. <laughs> so I want to tell you a secret. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. What's the secret? We will not all die. But we will all be transformed. Brethren, the summary of what I'm trying to say for the past 30-something minutes is that you believed in Jesus. It wasn't a casual decision, or even if, if it was a casual decision, that's okay. But the implication of you believing in Jesus, that he died for your sins, that he was buried and God raised him from the dead, this is the implication, number one. You became born again. What does it mean to be born again? You became born of the Spirit. Tell me more about that Spirit. So that same Spirit you were born of is the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And the fact that the Spirit of God raised Jesus from the dead, Romans 8, 11, the Bible says that same Spirit will quicken your mortal body. So two options. If Jesus is to appear again now, all of us who believe now will all be transformed. Immortality will swallow up mortality, and that will be the death of death itself. There will be no more death. Revelation talks about that. That's what we're trying to say. So when we say you have eternal life, what we are saying is you live forever. That means you are not going to live your life with the fear and anxiety of what the doctor said. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're not going to live the rest of your life on the doctor says I have so, so, so time to live. No. Your perspective will be I live forever because I have eternal life and the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will quicken my mortal body. For adventure, I sleep in the Lord before Jesus returns again. Does that make sense, everybody? Father, we just want to thank you. Thank you because... The truth of your word just brings a lot of rest to our heart. We are not afraid. Every fear of death right now begins to disappear. It melts away by your precious love and assurance of resurrection. That every one of us who believes in Jesus, that we will all be transformed. 
and death will not have the final say over us. That we'll all be raised, we're going to live forever. And our confidence is in the fact that you've done this on the body of Jesus, and you're going to do exactly the same thing on the body of every one of us who believes the gospel. Lord, we're forever grateful for this truth. It will dominate our heart every time. To the glory of your name, in Jesus' mighty name, I will pray. And let God's people say, Amen. Awesome. I want to say a big thank you for having me once again. And 